Okay, we're going to pick back up with the airway management portion here. All right, so oxygen cylinders, um, based on some of the information in the, the current textbooks and what is found on National Registry, they are filled under a pressure of 2,000 to 2,200 PSI. And most of these are going to be considered empty at 200 PSI. We like to bring this up because oftentimes in your agency, it may be that you guys change things out um, if they are under 500 PSI. But keep in mind that under 500 PSI, they're too low to keep in service based on like the standard from National Registry. So if you were to get a question about when should they be changed out, um, it, it should be at 500 at a minimum. Uh, because at 200, they are now considered to be empty. So oxygen delivery uh, devices here, nasal cannula, the flow rate here is going to be one to six liters per minute. And that's going to end up giving you about 24 to 44% oxygen. And here's kind of the way that you uh, figure that out. For every one uh, liter increase, we are increasing oxygen by about 4%. So if you can just remember that normal atmospheric pressure, we're at 21%. If I put a patient on one liter of oxygen, that ends up putting them at about 25%. Um, I know the, the slide here says 24, but it puts you in the right ballpark. So 24 to 25% somewhere in that area. And then if I put you on six liters, um, six times four is obviously 24 plus the 21 percent that you're already breathing. So the patient's going to be at about 44, 45 percent. So for every liter of increase, you're getting four percent oxygen. Uh, if you're looking at the uh, simple face mask, six to 10, um, it, the partial rebreather, uh, the non rebreather is the other one that is big for us in the pre hospital environment. And that should be delivered at a flow rate of anywhere between 10 and 15 liters per minute. And that's going to give you about 80 to 95% oxygen delivered. You're not going to probably get 100%. Uh, with a non rebreather mask because they are not true non rebreather mask. Uh, they actually have some, some valves there that if the patient were to run out of oxygen, um, they don't become hypercarbic and, and hypoxic because of that. So there are some different built-in mechanisms on the non rebreather mask that we use, which is why the patient is not getting uh, up to 100% on some of those devices. The nebulizer, anywhere from about six to eight liters, um, but basically this should be done just enough to get the medication to aerosolize. We do not want to put patients on a nebulizer and then crank the nebulizer up to 12 or 15 because basically what's going to happen is the, air, uh, the medication is going to aerosolize too quickly and then basically be ineffective because the patient wasn't able to get all of the medication into their system. So put your nebulizer together and then increase your flow rate until you get uh, aerosolization and then coach your patient on how to uh, take the medication in appropriately. And then your bag valve device uh, 15 liters or more, um, and this does give you close to 100% oxygenation if they have a reservoir, and the reservoir uh, may be in the accordion style uh, that has to extend out, or it may be in just a bag, uh, but either way, make sure that that accordion is either extended or your bag is inflated so that you know that you have good oxygen in the reservoir. If you do, that will deliver upwards of 100% oxygen to your patient. If you are bag valve assisting a patient um, with a flow rate of 15 liters of oxygen and your reservoir is not inflated or extended, depending on what type of device you're using, uh, then the patient is not getting 100%. They're getting about 40 to 60% oxygenation. So you can see it as a, a, sub, a substantial reduction. And that is why we want to make sure that we uh, have the reservoir the way that it is supposed to be. All right, so if you're not familiar with the uh, reservoir, this is the reservoir that I am talking about here. I'm kind of highlighting it uh, with the screen uh, on the, or with the, with the mouse on the screen. So that would hold the oxygen so that when the bag is squeezed, it pulls the oxygen from the reservoir and that is what allows the patient to get nearly 100% oxygenation. So 
Bag valve mask ventilations, positive pressure ventilation. Keep in mind that we should be using the EC technique if you are acting alone. This assures that we get a better seal for our patient. The breath should be delivered over about one second of time. We're going to squeeze the bag until we can see that the chest rises, and then we would release the bag, allowing the chest to, to fall. The average tidal volume is about 500 cc's in an adult patient, and the bag will hold anywhere from 1,000 to 1,600, depending on the manufacturer and who you get the bag from. So you do not need the entire bag. Um, in order to ventilate the patient. As long as you are delivering your breath over about one second and you see the chest rise, uh, then we know that they have an appropriate volume. We should be delivering about 12 breaths per minute in adults and at least 20 breaths per minute in infants and children because their basal metabolic rate, their base um, uh, respiratory rate, all of those things are increased. So we want to make sure that we're keeping up with their demand. So if you're ventilating a pediatric patient, uh, we should be ventilating them at 20 breaths per minute or more. If we're talking about the CPAP, the CPAP should be a tight fitting mask and it should have no leaks with it. Otherwise it defeats the purpose because you cannot have a good positive pressure if we have a leak um, found somewhere in the mask system. So the uh, adult protocol range from five to 10 centimeters of water and that's of PEEP. If you're not familiar um, the, and they won't test you on like a specific device because there's too many devices out there, but you could in fact get something that, you know, what would be an average PEEP for a patient that is on CPAP. And, and the answer would be somewhere around five to 10 centimeters per water. And these are adjustable PEEP valves here you can see the top blue is five, the yellow is seven and a half, and then the green is 10. So you would simply turn the style up at the top to change uh, what your uh, PEEP setting is for this patient. Some indications for your CPAP, and remember first and foremost that your patient should be alert and oriented. Um, so what we do is we say get the FN CPAP, okay? So it's a, a critical situation uh, potentially. So we need to make sure that we uh, are getting the CPAP um, and, and telling somebody to get the CPAP and get it placed pretty quickly. So if you can remember the mnemonic FN CPAP, it's flail, near drowning, COPD, pulmonary edema and pulmonary embolism, asthma and ARDS, and then pneumonia. Those are the reasons or the indications for when we would want to use CPAP. We feel like you should know the Malin Patty score. The Malin Patty score is a class one up to a class four. Um, and this is a terminology thing so that hopefully if you see Malin Patty on your examination, you're aware of what this is and you would be able to pick it out. So a class one is the best. This would be prior to doing direct laryngoscopy, especially if you're gonna be in a situation where you're paralyzing a patient. We wanna make sure that they have a good class one Malin Patty. Not to say that the others would be prohibited from doing a paralyzation, but clearly you're going to have a better success if they have a class one malampatic finding. If they do, you would have complete visualization of the soft palate. That is the definition of a class one malampatic. Class two, you can see, obviously, the tongue kind of comes up and it's covering more. You're not able to see the entire uvula. Um, so we're going to have a little bit more difficult intubation in this situation. So a class two would be a complete visualization of the uvula, which this diagram obviously does not depict uh, completely um, perfectly because we, we do have just a little bit of the uvula that has been cut off. But for the most part, uh, you can see the entire uvula. If you look at a class three, you're only able to visualize the base of the uvula. And I do think that's consistent with the Malampati three. And then the class four, the soft palate is not visible at all. So you can't see anything back here um, and what they're regarding the soft palate over here in the class one visualization. All right, pediatric intubation, uh, pediatric tube sizing. So there's a couple different ways that we can get to the end result of how uh, we should be determining pediatric tube size. So in an uncuffed tube, uh, we're looking at 16 plus the age divided by four. That would be the normal um, 
formula method for determining pediatric tube size. If they are using a cuffed tube, which has now kind of taken favor uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Heart Association, you may find that you're now uh, intubating with a cuff tube in peds, uh, which we previously did not really do. And that is 16 plus the age divided by three and a half. So what I think that you should be familiar with here is the, the top one, the 16 plus the age divided by four uh, would be the one that I would commit to memory prior to going in and taking your registry exam. Um, if we are measuring the depth of the endotracheal tube, it should be multiplied by three, okay? So what I mean by that is let's say that we've done the math for the uncuffed tube and we came up with a size 4.0 ET tube. If I am intubating my kid with a 4.0 and I multiplied four times three, that would give me a number of 12. So when I would intubate my kid, I should have it at 12 at the lip line. And if you think back, this is good for um, adults and pediatric patients. This was actually a study that was done and published in the Air Medical Journal many years ago. Um, and what they found was that if you're using an appropriate sized endotracheal tube and you multiply the, the tube size by three, that is what it should be at the lip. And if you guys remember back to when you were doing your field time, and doing intubations um, or in the operating room and you're intubating an adult patient, what is the lip line for most adult intubations? It would be somewhere around 20 or 21 at the lip. And so that holds true in the adult patient as well. So if you were using a size 5.0 ET tube, then it would be 15 at the lip, et cetera, et cetera. The diameter of the pinky finger or the diameter of the nair are kind of the fallback mechanism. So if you forget and, and you're in a real world situation, what size ET tube you should use, um, the, remember that kids pick their nose with their pinky finger. So the, the pinky finger will fit inside of their nair because that is oftentimes how they pick their nose. So we are looking for an endotracheal tube that will measure up to the same size as the pinky finger or one size smaller than the diameter of the nair so that it will fit. Um, and then ultimately a length-based tape, uh, whether that be a Broslow system or a hand-heavy system, depending on what you're using in your area. Uh, but again, for the most part, probably not going to be testable material uh, because they're now getting into to certain vendors, right? So what we're looking for here is making sure that you understand the formula and what a backup mechanism is so that you can select an appropriate sized ET tube. All right, so one of the things that we talked about at the very beginning was the cricoid, the thyroid, and the cricothyroid membrane. And, and I think that this is probably the best place to kind of explain to you what I'm talking about. Um, if we're talking about doing cric pressure, or a selic maneuver, or we're getting into a situation where we're doing a burp maneuver. So if you look at the diagram, the way that I've always been uh, taught to remember and how I've taught for many years as if you're in an emergency department and you hear a physician order a CT scan, uh, what would you think that the CT scan is being ordered of? And most of these would probably say a CT of the head. So the way that I remember this is CT towards the head. And what I mean by that is the cricoid cartilage is on the bottom. The thyroid T cartilage is on the top working towards the head. So if you can remember C, T towards the head, you hopefully won't get your anatomy confused um, when you're trying to locate the landmarks. Now, if we told you in the field that you had to do a selic maneuver, the place that we do a selic maneuver is over the crike uh, the cricoid cartilage. We want to make sure that we are doing crike pressure, which is the other name for a selic maneuver. And it's the same place where we would end up doing our burp maneuver. However, the cricoid cartilage is not very easy to find. So what we often do is we end up finding the, th the, the thyroid cartilage, also known as your Adam's apple. The Adam's apple or the thyroid cartilage is much easier to locate. So if you're doing one of these techniques or maneuvers, find that thyroid cartilage and then simply work your fingers downward, you should feel a potential space, which is this area right here. 
that potential space is the cricothyroid membrane. And then the very next space down is the cricoid cartilage. And the cricoid cartilage is the location where you should be performing either a selic maneuver or a burp maneuver. What the burp maneuver is, is if you have someone doing direct laryngoscopy, and in fact, you can even do this yourself if you are doing the intubation, is it is a backwards, upwards, rightwards pressure. So you would manipulate that cricoid cartilage to do backwards, upwards, rightwards, and then pressure, and that's on the patient so that hopefully it will help to bring the glottis into view. Um, other things that I think are important in this uh, slide in particular is a mnemonic called DOPE. And DOPE is something that we should be thinking about anytime that we have a problem with our endotracheal tube. And DOPE is a mnemonic that stands for um, dislodged, obstructed, a pneumothorax, or an equipment malfunction. And if you think about it, anytime that we have a patient that is intubated that we have problems with, um, it will fall into one of those four categories. So the tube either became dislodged, maybe they have a mucus buildup in the tube, giving it an obstruction, maybe they have developed a pneumothorax, a tension pneumothorax, more importantly, or it's an equipment malfunction, i.e. you've lost the uh, pilot balloon, um, the, the endotracheal tube has migrated into that right main stem bronchus, et cetera. But if you, if you can remember DOPE, um, hopefully you'll be able to troubleshoot your endotracheal tube. All right, so the nasotracheal tube um, indications here, if we're going to think about doing um, a nasotracheal intubation, the indication would be maxillofacial trauma. So maybe they have trauma to the face and you're not able to get um, an oral intubation in. Uh, perhaps they have what is known as angioedema which is swelling of the oral cavity or maybe the neck. Um, and this can be brought on by anaphylaxis or allergic reaction. They could have what is known as trismus. And trismus is another name for saying that they are clenched. Um, and then the glottis is largest during inspiration is something that we really need to be thinking about. So when the patient is breathing in, if we're doing a nasotracheal intubation, it is during inhalation that we should be advancing the tube, trying to get them to, uh, to basically breathe that in through the glottic opening. Contraindications for nasal intubation is apnea. Your patient has got to be breathing for the reason that we just talked about. The glottis is big during inspiration, so we want them to be breathing so that when we advance the tube, it will go in through the glottic opening, hopefully. If they are not breathing, it is an absolute contraindication. They cannot be nasally intubated if they're not breathing. If they have a bunch of mid-face fractures, so if they have Lafort fractures, Lafort two or three fractures, it may be a contraindication. If they have any type of nasal fractures or if they have a suspected basal or skull fracture. So the way that we would know a suspected basal or skull fracture is either battle signs or raccoon's eyes, if they have either one of those two findings. Remember, battle signs um, is the, uh, the retroauricular uh, echomosis or bruising behind the ear, right? And that, that retroauricular um, is, is simply just saying bruising behind the ear, but that's how National Registry may word that. Or they may have raccoon's eyes, which is the periorbital echomosis. Peri means around, um, so around the orbit, which is the eyes. Uh, so periorbital echomosis may be the other finding that you have with a patient um, with a suspected basal or skull fracture. And that, in, that concludes uh, the, uh, the portion on the advanced airway here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and then we will jump back in with the remainder of the topics here in just a moment.